Your enterprises have started off as a Branson Virgin idea, and then you've moved on and you've gone into uh, partnership with various people. And I'm interested to know what you're looking for when you get to that point with a business. Are you simply looking for a partner who can bring capital to the party? Uh, are you looking, as many business people in this audience will fully understand, the notion of spreading risk? You want to say, look, this is a lot of money at stake here, let's spread it around a little bit. Or are you also looking for people with whom you are comfortable to do that business? I.e., you can form an alliance, someone's got capital, they're prepared to take the risk, but he or she is not for me. So the value set that you apply when you're examining potential partnerships. Well, rep reputation is all, all we've got. I mean, there's, there's almost nothing else we have in life but our reputation. And, um, and so I think the first thing you look for is somebody um, with, with a good reputation, somebody that um, you can, uh, somebody that you can trust. Um, the second thing I think would be to see whether they can actually uh, bring, bring something to the party that we, we can't bring. Um, and I think you know the third thing would would, would be um, you know to, to to spread the risk to you know if there's if there's a new venture um, it, rather than putting all our own money in is to spread the risk. So so I think it's in, in roughly in that order of priority. They're going to stand for the same sort of things as you stand for. Yes, and also it's important you get on well together. And yeah. you know I mean if you know again going back to what I said earlier you know life is short and you must enjoy what you're doing and you must in, you know enjoy the people you're working with as well. Sure. Uh, we've also defined clearly over the last two or three days that, that another utterly crucial partnership, and you've touched upon this already, is, uh, as, as we talk about nowadays, our people. Um, uh, we're talking about staff, we're talking about employees. Um, in the old days of Marxist analysis, we were talking about wage slaves, but now it's become, quite rightly, a, a partnership. Is there a message that filters down through the various organizations that you are ultimately uh, the head of that says these are the kinds of people that we want to be a part of our group? Because whether you're buying a mobile phone or getting on an aeroplane or going on a train from London to Manchester, uh, it's your name that they're riding <coughs> with and they wave the flag for you. Uh, they can be great ambassadors for you or they can be revolutionary destroyers. So does that message filter down? Do you say to people, these are the kind of guys and gals that we want? Um, yes, I mean, I mean, what is a company? I mean, a, a, a company uh, isn't this brand, um, it isn't um, th this piece of metal that flies through the sky. Um, a company is, is people. Um, and, uh, you know, when we started Virgin Atlantic um, 25 years ago, um, we had a, you know, a wonderful team of people, enthusiastic, flying for it, and, and anyone who got on the plane, you know, they, they knew they were going to get on the plane, the, the, the staff were going to smile, they were going to, uh, they were going to have a wonderful experience, and, and the reason the staff smiled and, and gave, had a good experience was because they knew that the, the, the people who created Virgin Atlantic got every single little thing right, and, and therefore the staff were really proud of the company they worked for. Now the challenge was, could that still be the case in 25 years' time? And I, I remember sitting on that first flight, <coughs> wondering, you know, when we have 100 planes, will we still have that same spirit? Um, and the great thing, I think, you know, hopefully people here have flown on Virgin Atlantic and they will accept what I'm saying, is the staff is still as, as enthusiastic as they were 25 years ago. And, that, and that's a challenge for any company. As a company gets bigger, you know, can you keep that enthusiasm? Um, one way we've kept, um, kept our companies small whilst getting bigger um, is that when, when, when one of our companies gets over, say, 200 people in a building, I'll ask to see the deputy managing director, the deputy sales manager, the deputy marketing manager, and say, you are now the managing director, the sales manager, the marketing manager of a new company, um, and we'll split the company in two. Um, and then when that gets to a certain size, we'll do the same again. So for instance, when we were building our record companies, we had 20 separate buildings with 20 separate record companies with no more than 100 people in any one building. Um, and so they had that, they kept that enthusiasm by not 
ending up in this enormous, you know, big building, you know, just being a cog in the wheel. Um, they, 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 they felt that they all knew each other and they felt, you know, highly motivated. Yeah. But you're not a softie either. I mean, talking about the airline, you, you, you recently got within an inch of a real problem. You'd said what you thought the reasonable pay rate going forward was going to be. And some of them said, no, they, they didn't think that was right. And this man who believes in partnerships and works with his people had to say, that's what's right and that's what's fair. Take it or leave it. Now, as it happens, they took it and the business goes forward and crisis was averted. Did that hurt or was it simply the right thing to do at the time? I think the, um, the, the most hurtful time of any company is if you have any differences of opinion in, inside the company, any, any, um, you know, any battles, external battles, you, know, you, you work together to, you, to fight. And, and if you have a, um, an, an internal difficulty, that, that can be very painful. Um, uh, and most likely it means that um, the management have been at fault in some way or another. I mean, it's, it, you know, so you, you've got to you look yourself in the mirror and see you know, what, what have you done wrong if, if to, to have a situation where some of the staff are, uh, are unhappy. And, um, uh, in this particular situation, I, I, I did say uh, that I believed it was, a, it was a small minority and that um, if they needed higher salaries than the comp that particular company could afford, they should consider looking elsewhere, um, that they shouldn't affect you know, the whole company and put the whole company at risk. Um, and you know, I don't regret saying it. I think, I think personally it was the right thing to say at that time. Sure. Okay. Let's broaden it out again. Um, as we've already established, I mean, you are conscious of, of, of the role that you, you have in the businesses that you've created already and, and the role that you've played up to now, uh, 2008. Are you conscious of, of, of the role that you also have in, in helping form the world of the future? I mean, you and Joan are parents as well as employers, and even His Royal Highness Prince Turkey, who spoke on the first day, was saying, I'm very conscious of what my children are going to inherit from us, and we've not done a great job. And I'm even more worried about my six-and-a-half-year-old grandson, and we may not have been seen to have done a great job. Does that drive you, or are you a here-today-do-it-today man? No, it drives me. It drives me a lot now. Um, and uh, and you know, if you say take global warming as an example, um, it it is the biggest threat the planet faces. Actually, not so much the planet is the biggest threat that mankind who live on this planet face. The planet most likely will survive. Um, and uh, and and. You know, I've studied it, you know, quite in, in, you know, in, in great depth over the last th three or four years. I've met numerous scientists, um, uh, and um, and you know, it would be very comfortable for me owning, you know, five airlines, a train company, a space company, etc., to um, to ignore it. Um, but I know that my children are going to suffer from it, and my grandchildren are going to suffer greatly from it. Um, and, and therefore, the, there's no question that we, ha we all have a responsibility to try to um, address the problem. Um, so, you know, we, we, have t we have said that all the profits we make from our dirty businesses, our airline businesses, our space company, our train companies, uh, we will invest in trying to develop clean fuels, uh, fuels that uh, will not pollute the environment. Um, uh, and. Uh, and, and that's something we're working, we're working very, very hard towards. And we're also trying to improve things like wind power and solar power and, um, and, and, and other, other forms of energy that um, hopefully um, will enable our children to have a better future. I also mentioned in the introduction co um, conflict resolution. And let me play devil's advocate for a moment. I mean, in a sense, what's it got to do with you? as a successful business. What's it got to do with any successful businessman? There are crises around the world. We heard from the Prime Minister of Palestine on the first day, President of Bosnia-Herzegovina, who were talking to what their countries were going through and, and had gone through, uh, and what they wanted done by the, the political class and the diplomatic class and what have you. But why do you see that there is a role for someone like you as a successful businessman 
in conflict resolution and, and spending time talking to Nelson Mandela about it? Well, I'll switch the clock back a, a few years. Um, the, the, it looked inevitable that America was going to invade um, Iraq. Um, and, uh, and Saddam Hussein was like a, an, a, an animal up against the wall. He had no way of escaping. Um, and the consequences of the invasion of Iraq, I felt, were going to be dreadful. Um, uh, there were going to be hundreds of thousands of people maimed, killed, um, and you know there was a, a, a real danger. This whole region could have been un un unstabilized, um, and uh, and so you know if you've if, if so that we had to we had to try to think was is, was there a way to avoid the war, um, and um, and I believe that perhaps the only way to avoid the war was to send someone to see Saddam Hussein who he, he respected enough to fly out of Iraq with his head held high, maybe to go and live in Libya. Um, and so I asked Nelson Mandela, who had spoken out against the war, and um, I asked Kofi Annan, who was also concerned about the war, whether they would consider going to see Saddam Hussein. And, it took a week or two, but they agreed to do it, and we, we sent a plane to, to South Africa to take them there. Um, and sadly, the very day that they were due to go to Iraq, the, the bombing started, and, um, and, and the, the visit never took place. Um, but anyway, it got, it got me thinking um, that, that there are conflicts in the world where um, if we could get together the 12 most respected individuals in the world, and if Nelson Mandela and Grasha Michel, his wife, who I think most people in the world would say are, are perhaps two of the most respected people they, they look up to, if they could um, find the 12 most respected people, that when there were conflicts uh, that, that um, the, the politicians were having difficult, difficulty addressing, um, and maybe the United Nations was having difficulty addressing, that those people could go to those conflicts and, um, and, and try, to, try to deal with them. Um, and so Nelson Mandela has taken this group of elders together, um, a bit like in an African village where you know, Africans used to look up to their elders, um, a, a bit like in Saudi Arabia in, in, you know, in, 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 you know, 100 years ago where people would look up to their, their elders. But this would be on a, global, on a global basis. And so, for instance, in the last month, two of those elders, uh, Kofi Annan and Grasha Michelle, have been in Kenya trying to get the, um, the, you know, the, the lead, leaders of the opposition and the, um, and the leaders of Kenya to try to, you know, to reach agreement. And they, they're hopefully they're quite close to that. But, but I think there will be quite a lot of situations in the world where that may be possible. But to go back to your question, I am just, I was just the entrepreneur yeah. trying to get this set up. The we, enabler. The enabler, exactly. Yeah. And, and seeing, seeing something as an entrepreneur would do, how... how you know, I, can, I know how to address a business problem. Sometimes you can see a problem on a global scale that, that perhaps one could also help address. Let me float another example of that, though, uh, because I know personally, uh, because I'm slightly involved in it as well, but take a charity like the Lumbar Trust, which you've been a, a, a remarkably magnificent supporter of. It sounds sycophantic, but it's not meant to, because I, I know exactly what you've done. And here's a charity that has been established to right a social wrong, but a social wrong that is accepted within the system of a nation state. It happens 